when a single-engine turboprop crashes shortly after takeoff on a snowy South Dakota afternoon. Accident investigators initially suspect airframe icing, but data from the aircraft's flight recorder soon revealed more troubling possibilities. Was icing solely to blame, or were there hidden dangers at play? In this video, we'll examine the tragic sequence of events that left a permanent scar on four generations of the same family. This is the story of November 56 Kilo Juliet. It's the early afternoon of Saturday, November 30th, 2019, and the air is thick with falling snow. November 56 Kilo Juliet, a Pilatus PC-12, sits on the snow-covered tarmac of Chamberlain Municipal Airport. Inside, the private pilot prepares for the two-hour flight back to Idaho Falls after a hunting trip. On board are 11 of the pilot's family members who joined him on the excursion. That morning, the owner of the hunting lodge drove the pilot and one of the passengers to the airport so they could scrape ice off the airplane, which had been parked outside overnight. The lodge owner watches from the blustery ramp with concern. In the last 24 hours, the area received over two inches of snow and freezing drizzle, and conditions seem to be worsening. He suggests that the pilot and his passengers stay another night at the lodge to wait out the storm. The pilot insists that they need to get home and declines the offer. The lodge owner pulls out his cell phone to record the frigid scene. His images capture the buildup of frozen precipitation on the tail, despite the pilot's efforts to remove it. Icicles hang off the stabilizer fairing. As the Pilatus taxis toward the runway, he sees it vanish into the mist and reappear several times. Inside the FBO, the airport manager radios the pilot and tries to dissuade him from departing. The snow is falling so fast that it's outpacing his plowing efforts. It don't look good to me. I don't know what you guys are thinking. Uh, is the runway in good condition? I would say I can hardly keep up. All right, I'll be okay. Five, six kilo Juliet. What's that? Uh, we're gonna be just fine. Uh, I'll go uh, back taxi three one and we'll uh, take off out of here. Six kilo Juliet. Okay, the runway is not clear. Oh, I thought you had the, oh, uh, let me, let me back taxi down and look at it. Then I'll be back. Well, you guys are crazy. I got berms on this thing. I gotta get the snow out of here. That don't look good to me. I think we're going to be just fine right down this uh, one track you've made. Six kilo Juliet. Guys don't mind plowing through some drifts. At 12.32 p.m. Central Standard Time, 56 kilo Juliet begins its takeoff roll. The lodge owner records the takeoff with his phone. He can just barely make out the Pilatus as it leaves the runway. Five seconds later, the aircraft climbs into the mist and disappears from view. Fifteen minutes later, Minneapolis Center calls the airport's manager to inquire whether 56 Kilo Juliet has departed. The aircraft never checked in with ATC after takeoff. Immediately, the manager knows something has gone terribly wrong. Around two hours after takeoff, a property owner discovers the wreckage of November 56 Kilo Juliet in a dormant cornfield three-quarters of a mile west of the airport. The pilot and eight passengers were killed. Incredibly, Three passengers survived with serious injuries. What caused 56 Kilo Juliet to crash shortly after takeoff? Although not required by Part 91 regulations, 56 Kilo Juliet was equipped with a light data recorder, or LDR. The LDR combines cockpit voice and flight data recording in one unit, and it had captured information from several days of flights. Initially, it revealed that 56 Kilo Juliet had entered a left turn shortly after takeoff before descending and impacting terrain. But as investigators began to piece together what happened, several red flags emerged that ultimately led to a shocking conclusion. To find out what happened, investigators examined four aspects. The weather, the pilot's experience, the aircraft's weight and balance, and the pilot's actions on the day of the accident. Let's turn back the clock to the day before the accident, Friday, November 29th. 56 Kilo Juliet arrived at Chamberlain Municipal at 9.27 a.m. local time. Fueling records show the pilot loaded 150 gallons of Jet A into the Pilatus before parking it on the ramp and heading to the lodge. By the late afternoon, 
a mixture of snow, mist, drizzle, and unknown precipitation had begun to fall. The temperature hovered around freezing. The pilot awoke the next morning to bleak conditions. To fly home that day, he'd need to spend quite some time scraping the airplane clean of snow and ice. Any frozen precipitation left on the airplane's flight surfaces can severely destroy lift and increase drag, making flight difficult or impossible. Countless accidents have been caused by even trace amounts of airframe icing. Chamberlain Municipal does not have any de-icing equipment. The pilot borrowed a seven-foot ladder from the lodge, bought isopropyl alcohol at a local hardware store, and began removing the frozen precipitation with the help of a passenger. The lodge owner stated that the pilot and passenger worked for about three hours to remove approximately a quarter inch of ice and snow. But due to the height of the Pilatus's T-tail, neither could reach the snow coating the horizontal stabilizer. The owner also noticed some snow on the left side of the aft fuselage, but the pilot told him the airplane was 98% good and the remaining ice would come off during takeoff. Despite the continuing snowfall, the pilot decided to press on with the flight. This was a serious gamble, and for investigators, it was the first red flag. What other corners had been cut? The lodge owner reported the pilot thought there would be favorable weather between 11.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m., but that assertion was not based on current weather reports. In fact, the area forecast discussion published at 11.44 a.m. described the weather as about as messy and complex as a forecast gets over the next 24 to 36 hours with multiple precipitation types, precipitation regimes, and winter hazards. The NTSB discovered that the pilot had received a weather briefing online at 12.04 p.m., the day of the accident. The briefing was basic, but showed widespread IFR conditions. It included METARs, PIREPs, TAFs, and NOTAMs, but no graphical weather depictions, charts, or airmets. Had the pilot requested airmets, he would have found three active at the time of departure. At 8.45 a.m., the National Weather Service issued Airmet Tango and Zulu advisories for moderate turbulence below 9,000 feet and moderate icing from the freezing level up to flight level 220. At 10.22 a.m., they issued an Airmet Sierra for widespread IFR conditions. This was not a good day for flying, even in an aircraft certificated for flight into known icing conditions. More important, however, is the fact that the PC-12's de-icing and anti-icing equipment cannot protect the aircraft from ice picked up on the ground. Next, investigators turned their attention to the pilot. He was 48 years old and had an estimated 2,314 hours of flight time, 1,274 of which was in the PC-12. He held a private pilot certificate with single-engine land and multi-engine land class ratings and was instrument rated. His class three medical was current and had no limitations. His last flight review and instrument proficiency check was one year before the accident and he attended PC-12 recurrent training sessions in 2017 and 2018. However, the logbook entries became spotty from 2018 onward. The NTSB determined that the pilot had flown 10 hours in the last 90 days and two hours in the last 30 days. This implies that the flight to Chamberlain was his only flight in November. For the last 15 years, the pilot averaged 100 hours of flight time per year but an insurance form showed the pilot only flew about 40 hours in 2018 and possibly only about 19 hours in 2019. This lack of recency could indicate atrophying skills, but it was impossible to determine if it directly contributed to the accident. But what investigators learned next couldn't be excused by rusty skills alone. Shortly after noon, the rest of the passengers arrived at the airport. At 12.14 p.m., 5.6 Kilo Juliet's cockpit voice recorder started capturing the boarding process. Two minutes later, the aircraft door was closed and locked. One passenger asked the pilot about the de-icing process. How much ice was there this morning? Oh, there was a lot. Come off okay or no? Well... Before the pilot could finish the thought, he was interrupted. 
One passenger recited the traveler's prayer, asking for protection in this not so great weather. The danger of the wintry conditions was not lost on those in the back. At 1219, 56 Kilo Juliet's engine roared to life. A total of 12 people were on board the 10-seat Pilatus. This was concerning for two reasons. First, it meant two passengers in the cabin did not have seats. This violated Federal Aviation Regulation 91.107, which states all passengers over the age of two must be belted in a seat. The youngest person aboard 56 Kilo Juliet was seven years old. Second, 12 passengers with baggage almost certainly put the aircraft over the weight limit and likely out of balance as well. This was red flag number two. The NTSB determined that the airplane weighed 10,557 pounds at takeoff, 107 pounds above the approved maximum gross weight of 10,450 pounds. Although aircraft should never be flown over weight, the extra 107 pounds likely didn't directly cause the crash. The center of gravity calculation turned out to be the more important factor. Depending on where the two unseated passengers were in the cabin, Investigators determined the CG was between 3.99 and 5.49 inches behind the aft limit. An aircraft with a far aft CG is much less stable in flight. Pitch becomes harder to control, and stall recovery becomes challenging and sometimes impossible. Pilatus engineers corroborated the CG calculation by replicating the lodge owner's photographs. In their report, they said, we couldn't recreate the viewpoint of a person standing on the ground, even after loading 200 kilograms of sandbags into the rear of the fuselage. Instead, the photographer had to stand on a ladder. This further corroborates that the accident aircraft was sitting on the ground tail low. The flight data recorder showed an average pitch angle of 2.8 degrees during taxi. Normally, the average pitch angle on the ground is 1 degree, yet more proof of a far aft CG. This would have serious implications for the controllability of 56 Kilo Juliet. Could this have caused the pilot's difficulties after takeoff? Interestingly, investigators soon discovered another key piece of the puzzle. At 1224, the pilot called Minneapolis Center on his cell phone to receive his IFR clearance. Three minutes later, Center cleared 56 Kilo Juliet direct to Idaho Falls Regional Airport with an initial altitude of 8,000 feet. The clearance was void after 1235, giving the pilot only seven minutes to taxi to the runway, backtrack, and take off. Before the aircraft began to taxi, the LDR captured the master caution parameter, changing from caution to no caution. Investigators determined this to be consistent with the stick pusher test being conducted and passed successfully. The stick pusher and stall protection system would turn out to be important factors in the accident. To understand why, let's take a closer look at how they work and why they're necessary. During normal flight conditions, the PC-12 is a very docile airplane beloved by pilots worldwide. But if allowed to enter a stall, the aircraft is difficult to recover without a substantial loss of altitude. To address this issue, Pilatus added a sophisticated stall warning system designed to prevent the airplane from ever entering a stall. If the system's angle of attack vanes sense the aircraft is approaching a stall, a visual and aural alert and stick shaker activation will occur. The stick shaker vibrates the control wheel, mimicking a stall buffet. If the pilot doesn't respond, the stick pusher forces the control wheel forward, decreasing the angle of attack. According to Pilatus, this can cause an altitude loss of around 150 to 200 feet. If the pilot overrides the stick pusher by brute force or disconnects the system, the aircraft can enter a sudden and dramatic stall. Pilatus states that this can result in severe rolling forces and a loss of altitude up to 700 feet. If a pilot activates icing protection, the stick pusher automatically enters what's known as ice mode Ice mode reduces the stall protection system's angle of attack limit by 8 degrees to compensate for the aerodynamic impact of icing. At maximum takeoff weight, with 15 degrees of flaps, the stall speed increases from 78 knots to 87 knots, and the rotation speed increases from 82 knots to 92 knots. The accident pilot was no doubt aware of the stall protection system 
and the importance of avoiding a stall. But the LDR revealed that he didn't adjust the takeoff procedure as required by ice mode activation. Here's what happened. At 12.32 p.m., 56 Kilo Juliet began its takeoff roll on snow-covered runway 31. The propeller de-icing system and the engine's inertial separator were active, which meant that the stick pusher was in ice mode. Instead of waiting for the airplane to reach the required 92 knots, the LDR showed the pilot rotated early at 88 knots, four knots too slow. The aircraft immediately banked to the left and the stall warning system activated for the first of six times. LDR data shows that the pilot increased the pitch angle during rotation far faster than required. Pitched up through 9.8 degrees, paused briefly at 11.8 degrees, then increased to a maximum of 15.8 degrees. This was well above the flight director's target attitude of 9 degrees. Historical data showed that the pilot regularly rotated too fast, particularly when compared to the data from other pilots who flew the same airplane. Six seconds later, the pilot steadily lowered the nose to 9.8 degrees, but the aircraft was already in a precarious position. A series of pitch oscillations began as the pilot struggled to maintain control, made worse by the far aft center of gravity. 16 seconds after takeoff, the stick pusher activated for the first of four times. The oscillations reached a maximum of 21 degrees nose up as the aircraft slowed to 80 knots before plummeting to 24 degrees nose down five seconds later. 56 Kilo Juliet had entered an aerodynamic stall only 380 feet above the ground. It rolled 63 degrees to the left before impacting terrain five seconds later. To weigh the impact of each factor in the crash, the NTSB carried out an extensive performance analysis using flight simulators. They determined that the probable cause was the pilot's loss of control shortly after takeoff, which resulted in an inadvertent low altitude aerodynamic stall. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's improper loading of the airplane, which resulted in reduced static longitudinal stability and his decision to depart into low instrument meteorological conditions. The NTSB's performance study states that they couldn't quantify the impact of ice contamination, but it is certain that the accumulations would increase the airplane's gross weight and could only hamper, and not improve, the airplane's aerodynamic performance and handling qualities. Pilots who consistently ignore regulations and take unnecessary risks will inevitably exhaust their luck. You might get away with leaving a bit of ice on the tail, rotating faster and pitching higher than required, being slightly overweight, or having a slightly aft CG, but not all at once. Follow the rules and fly safely. Thanks for watching.